from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. You ready, John? And we're rolling. Uh, I'm Emily Crosby of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm conducting this oral history as part of the Civil Rights History Project, which is sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution's African American, um, I'm sorry, National Museum of African American History and Culture and the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress. Today is August 24th, Four. yes, 20, 2000, uh, 2013. Yeah. And we're in the Northboro Free Library, and I'm here with Mrs. Virginia Sims George, her husband Frederick George, and John Bishop, who's videotaping, uh, doing the videography. Thank you for joining us. Today. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me um, about your your family and where you're from and growing up. Okay, um, I'm actually uh, from Virginia, and when I say that, everybody you know is quick to say, "Oh, you're named after the state." But my grandmother was named Virginia, and my father indicated I was named after my grandmother, who probably was named <laughs> after the state. But I was born in Newport News, Virginia, which is uh, on the Tidewater, and um, I have one brother who's 13 months older than I am, and uh, my father and mother uh, separated when I was a very young child, and so I was raised by my father, my brother and I for the most part. Um, so um, I went to school in um, Newport News and I think uh, since this is talking partly about the civil rights movement, uh, I'll just share when I was uh, coming up, Newport News was very much segregated and I grew up um, and I just in town and um, my father remarried, and after we, he remarried, he, they bought a home, and we moved out to the suburbs. And uh, when we moved to the suburbs, what was happening was all the white people were leaving that area and going further uh, out where they would not be living with, uh, with blacks. Um, there were two people, I think, live, still there when we moved, and um, she was our next door neighbor, and she happened to say to my father that had I known, you know, that you guys were such good people, I never would have sold my home. But that was my first real experience with the idea that there was a difference. Um, and then going up to visit my aunt, who still lived on the street where, my, where, where I was born and grew up, I actually took a bus, which was the first time I'd ever, I'd ever ridden a bus in town. And I was probably about 12. I didn't know really the etiquette of the bus, so I got on, and there's a seat, you know, like this way, and then the rest of the seats go. And I sat there, and there was a white lady next to me, and I wasn't sure. I didn't know I would, shouldn't have sat next to her. She jumped up, she moved to the other side, and she started to look at me, scowling and, and frowning. And I felt so bad. And then I remember going home, talking to my father. And that's when my father talked to me a little bit about race and the experiences. And in his mind, the thing to make a difference was education. Mm -hmm. And my father would always say, you know, you need to get your education because if you get it up here, no one can take it from you. That was one of the first things, and my brother uh, had gone, had lived in Germany for about five years, and he came home, and he and my father went to a hardware store, and a white clerk came up and said, "Me, what can I do for you boys?" And I think my brother, having lived in Germany for such a long period of time, you know, realized that really wasn't right. And I remember him telling us that he said, you know, this is my father, he's no boy, and he left. But in Virginia, where I grew, they used the words boys and girls as a means of demeaning uh, black people. So um, I had decided that I wanted to be a lawyer and I was going to, you know, fight. Um, for the civil rights of all African American people. I graduated from high school and I 
we didn't have counselors, you know, that really gave the kind of advice that our children get today. So I ended up going to Virginia Union University. And actually, my father had gone there for a year. And I think the dorm that I stayed in used to be a man's dorm, and it really was had turned into a woman's dorm. So I went there with not really thinking I was going to be a lawyer and majoring in history. And I, it was straight history because the intent was to go to law school somewhere, somehow. So that's a little bit about me. Can I ask a few follow-up sure. questions? So um, what kind of work did your father do? My father was a postman. Okay. Um, and so you said that when, when, you, when he remarried and bought the house and moved out to the mm -hmm. more suburban area, so was this in the 50s? Probably. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And that's when, and, and this is when there's that sort of transition with whites moving right, out. Right, moving and out and blacks moving out uh, to their area. So the neighbor lived there long enough to get a sense of your family, but had already sold her had house? Had already sold her house, and it was too late to turn around, you know, but she was saying, uh, if I'd known, I wouldn't have That's really, kind of thing. That's really sort of interesting, you know, yeah. that she would, not that it would be true, but mm -hmm. just that she would have that thought and articulate it in mm -hmm. that era. Never will forget that, you know, yeah. because uh, the neighborhood that we moved in was, as I said, was transitioning. There yeah. were a couple of doctors, uh, African-American doctors, um, business people and everything like that, but all, you know, to the white people it was like, they're black. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't mingle, can't live together, and so they, they sold their homes they and they didn't left. really consider the class issues or, at all. Or yeah. that we were people. Right. Exactly. You know, <laughs> and that probably nice people, oh, as yeah. we turned out, you know, to be. But, you know, my father was, um, was a postman. He was very active um, in organizations and very much um, encouraged us to go and get educated. So at this point in... Virginia. Well, let me actually back up. So do you remember things like the Brown decision or the Little Rock mm -hmm. integration or yeah, anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saw it, it all on TV, you know, and um, it was interesting and something that um, just, you know, never thought about, you know, because so our schools were black. We had um, our neighborhoods were black when I was a little kid. Um, there was a store, I remember Jefferson Avenue was a busy street, and on that store there was a department store run by uh, white people, and that's where we would go and we would shop. But we had our own, you know, like restaurants or uh, places to go. It was totally separated, so uh, you didn't really come in contact with uh, white people, but my father, being a postman, worked on a route that was white. Okay. And so, um, and he enjoyed it. He'd come yeah. home Christmas with these big bags of presents because all the, you know, post, all the people really yeah. loved and respected him and they re remembered him at Christmas. But yeah, it was um, during that time, you know, we expected to go to a black school. We yeah. had black teachers, we had no white teachers, you know. And um, everybody, the principal, the counselors, the teachers, Everything was after was black. It's interesting too because Virginia at that time, probably what must have been while you're in school because of the of the timing, you know, was closing schools. Um, uh, the Prince Edward County schools, I think, mm -hmm. that were part of the Brown decision, that when they were forced to integrate, um, you know, Virginia was one of the states leading the way in closing black schools rather than, or closing public schools okay. rather than integrate. Now that only happened in a couple communities. Right, that's what I was going to say. So in our community uh, at the time it was still, you know, so I was born in Newport News, next to us is Hampton, and then you had Warwick. Um, what started to happen was that Newport News, and, I, and it probably had something to do with voting and re and uh, representation and everything like that, they began to expand Newport News over toward mm -hmm. Warwick. So I, that probably was taken in consideration that a lot of white people had moved out of the town and, and they were in Warwick. Okay. And so then the boundaries were moved so that you could keep it. But, you know, 
it was it was a way of life for so us. So in Newport News, were African Americans able to register and vote at that yeah, time? Yeah, they were. We were. Okay. So in some ways, it's a uh, you know I know different states have different mm -hmm. sort of cultures in different parts of the state. So the thing to also remember is Newport News um, is had the Newport News shipbuilding. Mm -hmm. So they had this humongous business because they built these very, what, three city blocks long ships and everything. So you had, you know, that industry there. Plus you had um, Air Force, mm -hmm. Army, Navy, Merchant Marines, you name it. First of the month, everybody, these ships, these sailors and everybody would yeah. hit the town. Yeah. So, needless to say, I didn't go out. Okay, <laughs> I, I, had, I had to be, I had to be chaperone, and the worst chaperone of all was my brother. I bet. You know, I couldn't go, I couldn't go out unless I went with my brother or with my neighbor, uh, and friend, because her mother would take us to places and bring us back. But so you had that happening in town at the same time. I was going to say, so there's in some ways there's this federal influence probably, there's a, and somewhat, there's a, and somewhat. there's a strong enough African American community to have a self-contained business, right? And so right. Yeah. And and our churches, of course, were black. Mm. Um, everything, funeral homes, yeah. churches, drugstores. Yeah. Because my one of my first jobs, or not my first, but one of the jobs I had was I worked as a soda jerk clerk in a drugstore. Mm -hmm. And the person, one of the owners of the drugstore, um, son was my brother's best friend and lived in the block just mm -hmm. ahead of us, plus another doctor. So Dr. Jones and Dr. Tucker owned the drugstore. Okay. And so, of course, all of us <laughs> blacks came to the same place to get our prescriptions, to have Sundays, or mm -hmm. buy the things that we needed, that they mm -hmm. carried. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it must have been, in many ways, uh, a good community to grow up in. I, I think so. You yeah. know, um, I think, you know, and I sometimes I share with Fred, I was a debutante yeah. and all like that because we had our own society. and. Being a debutante meant that you didn't date or you had not dated and everything like that, and you were selected to be presented. And <laughs> I know that's foreign to people today, but um, because I, I wasn't able to go you know, out and to date, I could not date until I was 16. And when I was 16, I was presented to society where you had you know, meetings, you had practice and everything, and it was a debutante cotillion where you wore white yeah. dress, gloves, pearls, pearl yeah. earrings, and you danced with your father. Did you enjoy that? Ah, oh, loved it, loved yeah. it. I remember, uh, actually, my stepmother made my dress, and it was so big. My uncle, um, my dad wasn't driving at that time, and, and so my uncle had a big old Cadillac, and I remember sitting in the back seat, and my dress took the whole <laughs> seat, you know, yeah. and everything like that. So yeah. it was fun, you know. Yeah. Um, now I think of it, you know, I, I did. I, I, I really feel that um, I had a lot of great experiences, had a lot of great um, people who um, influenced me and helped me. Um, one of uh, my very best friends, I, I babysat for her. Her name was Marion Benz, and her husband was the first black urologist in Virginia. And I used to uh, babysat for her, and she was also encouraging me to go to school and helped to get my wardrobe and helped me to save and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And the same for the next door neighbor. So um, I felt that I had a lot of support. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Are you back. okay? Okay. Um, you mentioned that incident on the bus and mm -hmm. deciding that you wanted to be a lawyer. Were those mm -hmm. connected? I mean, was it? You know, I don't know. I just remember that incident had a real impact on me because, um, you know, I, I just got on the bus. I hadn't done anything to her. I didn't even know who she was. Probably would never see her again. But it began to help me to understand that there was a difference in me because I was black and she was white. Yeah. And that that's when you began to know that... Um, their differences. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember my father would come home and tell me about some of his uh, people he, you know, carried mail to. Their daughters were 
getting married, you know, going to high school, getting married. And that was the thing that they did. And he did not want me to do that. He wanted me to go to school because he wanted me to be better, mm-hmm. uh, wanted me to better my life, mm-hmm. have an opportunity, I guess, to better my life. So I, I couldn't say, I guess the other thing, there was a lawyer, her name was Marion L. Poe, and she was the first African-American female lawyer that I ever knew yeah. or saw, and I just thought she was marvelous and wonderful, and I wanted to be like a, like Attorney Poe, P-O-E. How so. did you see her? I mean, how did you know she her? She was at church. She went yeah. to our church, and... Um, and I just knew her from church. Mm-hmm. I went to school with her grandkids, probably. Did you remember whether you and you know other children in the community or at church, whether there were discussions of the NAACP or the events like the Montgomery bus boycott or things like that? No, I can't remember. Yeah. 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 And so, um, when did what year did you start college? Nineteen. 59. 1959. So you were there in fall 59? The fall 59 was my first semester. What was that like? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It was yeah. my first time away from home Yeah. and living on my own. And uh, I, I remember I got in a little trouble because uh, at Virginia Union, it was, a, it was very, it was a Baptist school and you just couldn't do things. And I remember uh, when you wanted to go out, you were supposed to ask. And I can remember, and you're supposed to go with another student and everything. And I can remember going downtown to Richmond by myself without checking out, without asking. And um, I met uh, Maurice Ellison, who was one of the people who was arrested. She's, you've seen her, may have seen her picture. Okay. Uh, Maurice Ellison and Patricia Washington. Well, the two of them were roommates, and they were diagonally across the hall. And we used to, they used to get in trouble, and I would do, maybe ground it because of them, but we hung together, <laughs> and we had a lot of fun, okay, yeah. you know, doing crazy things. Like, uh, I remember one time Maurice and Pat were chasing each other around the dorm or something, and the uh, dorm lady <laughs> making too much noise and came in and grounded us, you know, because I was sitting on the bed laughing, you know, so... Well, you're not uh, laughing aloud. Well, <laughs> they were being bad, and I was part of it because I was supporting them. Yeah. And uh, they were supposed to be cleaning the room because we were going away for one of the holidays or something, and they never they weren't getting it done and all like that. But I really enjoyed uh, the first year because the dorm had a basement, and you could go down in the basement. They'd have dances. So even though if we were grounded, we sneaked down there anyway. You know, like take a, because um, it was the wash area as well. So we'd take a blouse or something like we were going to wash clothes and go in and dance and then come back. <laughs> oh, we turned the clock back. So, so, so that when we went, uh, we were in before curfew. So these are things Fred doesn't know about me. <laughs> we did a little devilish thing. And then one thing I remember, and I, I never told my father, but I remember asking my father, if I could go to the pin relays, and he said yes, and um, I didn't tell him how it was going, and he didn't ask, so we actually went in a car. Maurice, Pat, and myself went with some guy yeah. to Philadelphia to the pin relays. Well, Pat was from uh, from uh, from there, from outside of Philly, in a place called Norristown, and uh, so we're all going to stay at Pat's house, and we had an opportunity to meet her parents, and um, it was really nice. Formed a relationship. As a matter of fact, I think the next year I went to Philadelphia and I stayed with Pat, and I worked mm. uh, during the summer before going back to school. So when you all would uh, go off, sneak off to downtown Richmond without signing out, was that because you're going to do something that you couldn't sign well, out for, or just resisting those regulations? Probably, probably a little bit of both. But one time we went down there, so I have to tell you, Pat um, would could pass for white, okay, and none of us could understand. Her parents looked white, and her mother and her father they really looked white, and Pat looked white. So we went to Richmond, and I don't remember when this was, we went to Richmond, and she went into a, a barber shop, a white barber shop. We waited outside. She went in there and got her hair cut. <laughs> and they didn't know she was black. 
because she looked white. And, and she's all. doing that just because of the because segregation. Because of the segregation and things like that. We thought it was funny, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we went with her and waited, and she got a haircut. And we came out and said, oh, they don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so sort of means of resistance. Right? Yeah, and then, um, and Maurice, so Maurice, Pat, and I, you know, we hung together, and we did things together, and consequently, when uh, they were talking about the sit the three of us, you yeah. know, banded together, of course, and we, we were going, and all three of us got arrested. Can you, do you remember how you felt when you first heard, or do you remember how you first heard about the sit-ins? Well, they were going all around. I mean, you had, um, I think it was in North Carolina with the Woolworth. Mm -hmm. You had heard about them. Um, and then people were actually coming to the campuses, talking about getting involved, um, I believe Martin Luther King had come. We had two people who were ministers, um, Frank Pinkston and Charles Sherrod. Mm -hmm. You might remember Sherrod's wife. Yeah. You remember her? Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But Charles, the two, Charles and Frank, sort of led, pulled us together. And uh, we started to talk about it. We had meetings. We started to talk about it and strategize what we would do in Richmond. Mm -hmm. Can you describe um, Charles Sherrod uh, and Frank Prince uh, Pin? Oh, it's, like a, it's been so well, long ago. I, I don't, I remember uh, Frank, I remember wore glasses. Yeah. He was a minister and it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Both of them were very nice, very articulate and great leaders. Mm -hmm. Great so, leaders. So they were really the the kind of driving they, force. They were the driving force, and they were the ones that helped us to understand that they probably would be taken because it, it was obvious that they are they were our leaders mm -hmm. and that uh, one one go down, the other one would stand up. Okay. So it wasn't a matter of us falling apart because the two of them had been arrested. So they prepared you for what would they happen. They prepared us they for what happened. To we had decisions. other people that were working with us mm -hmm. and everything, and they talked to us about the need for nonviolence, mm -hmm. the need to be calm, the need not to um, let people get to us mm -hmm. because certainly there would be that happening to us, and. Um, so and it and it did, it did. Were you afraid? I was. I wasn't afraid. I was so excited and I was so proud. And the interesting thing is, I never talked about it. Yeah. This, this is. I never. I mean, I don't even know when I finally told Fred. I might have told him early on in our relationship. But I remember my young nephew coming and he was telling all his friends Aunt Jenny had been arrested, and all. But I never, never, ever talked about it. Um, it, it was just something that I had done because I felt it needed to be done because I just felt that uh, black people were treated so unfairly. So I was excited, you mm -hmm. know, I was excited when I was shocked was after I got out of jail and everything. And that, that's a different story, but I came home and I was looking at the night news and I saw myself. I saw them lead me out of the store Remember them putting me in a paddy in a, in a squad car to the, I guess to the paddy wagon came and then lead me from there, and put me into a paddy wagon and I said, oh my God, I better call my father, he may see the news, okay, and that's when I realized you know I had I needed to connect. Yeah, so it seemed more serious when it you actually saw when I yourself saw that. being arrested. It, it was it was real. It happened. And it was documented that it had happened, and I needed to let my dad know. Yeah. Are you comfortable? I'm doing. Is it okay? Oh, it's wonderful. We're yeah. back. Can you? Um, was were you arrested on the first sit-in you participated in, or did you participate? Was there one or two before that? It was just that? one. Okay. There was one. We walked. We marched. Okay. And uh, we marched downtown, and then we went back. And we went to this de de department store called Tohamas. Tohamas is very much like Macy's, mm -hmm. was our Macy's, you know. Um, and the interesting thing about that store was we could shop there, but that was it. We could go there, we could spend our money. If we wanted something to eat, we had to go to the basement 
and they had a stand, you know those Orange Julius stands where you could go? That's what we had to do. And we spent as much money as anyone else would, would, would and did spend. But there was the Rose Room, the Richmond Room. I always call it the Rose Room where we were not allowed. Black folks couldn't go in there. And um, so that was our target. And so is that something you'd experienced? I mean, you'd been down there and used that store before? I've, oh, yeah, I've been to the store. I've been down to the counter, the orange juice, getting a mm. hot dog and a, and a soda or something like that. And, and then, you know, you ask the question, well, our money, isn't our money good? Yeah. You know, our money spends, we purchase, we support the store, and yet we can't, you know, enjoy the Richmond room yeah. because of our color. You know, and that's when we just said, you know, that's when those of us, you know, we thought about it and said, hey, that, that can't be. Not today. We need to change. Times need to change. Were there students that tried to talk you out of it? No. 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 Not at all. No. The students, the faculty, nobody yeah. said anything derogatory. We just got a lot of support. Did you, I know this was true of students at some schools, but did you worry about being put out of school? No. No. Not at all. Yeah. Had all we had support. We had full support. Can you describe the support? Uh, well, there was never. I never. I never remember anyone talking to us about what we did that mm -hmm. it was wrong or that we shouldn't have done it. We didn't have any sanctions. We were able to con go to school, continue to go to school. We were very much sought. After mm -hmm. we went to churches at night to see pe people greeted us with support. They yeah. had dinners, you know, um, programs. They introduced us. It was just like you guys did a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. and we really value and think, you know, that you're very special. Well, that's wonderful. So you got a lot of and support. we had lawyers yeah. um, that uh, bailed us out of jail and would be with us um, in some of the meetings that we went to. Mm -hmm. After that first sit-in and you're arrested, did the sit-ins continue in Richmond or were things sort of on hold? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I think, I can't actually remember. I know the next step was we were going to Mississippi. Okay. We were going to have some buses and go into Mississippi. I don't know how many students went. I know that's when my father put his foot down. <laughs> he says, no, you yeah. will not go. You need to stay and you need to focus on getting your education. I don't want you dead. Did you? He feared for my life. And so, I, of course, I listened. Mm -hmm. Did you feel, did you want to go? Oh, I was ready to go. Yeah. I, at, at that time, I think what had happened, if, if I had gone to Mississippi, I probably would have been either dead or still doing stuff. And maybe, you know, I don't know, my life may have taken a different yeah. turn. But as it was, I stayed in school. And I don't really remember, Emily, uh, what happened because at that time, we were busy. Mm -hmm. We we all those of us who got arrested, because we had to go to court, we had to meet with the lawyers. We were going throughout the city, so I don't even remember the mm -hmm. other stuff that was going on. Um, I, I I just remember that when I got arrested, um, I had long fingernails and they had trouble fingerprinting me, so mm -hmm. I was arrested. I was taken to jail. I was taken to jail, and they were trying to fingerprint me, and they had difficulty fingerprinting me. And by the time they finished, my lawyer was there okay. to bail me out. It was by then. It was very tired. Oh, you. Were, I was. I remember being very tired. Yeah. You know, because it had been a long day. We had walked to the city, uh, walked to the store. We had walked and stood in line. We had been pulled out, arrested. We were. They. It was. It was. I just remember it was like dark after, after yeah, six, yeah. and I remember walking with uh, my lawyer, whom I don't remember the name or anything now, and a white man stood in front of me and was big and spit at me mm. and said something, and the lawyer just, you know, like, got at me out. Yeah. But at that time, I think I had lost all of my <laughs> nonviolence, <laughs> <laughs> and I was ready to do battle, you know, because uh, I, I, I guess I was, I've always been a little militant, and yeah. I, I was ready to take them on. But yeah. 
I didn't. But your lawyer moved you on. We we had to move on, and we could not engage. That was the thing that it was emphasized more than anything, that we had to be peaceful, we had to be respectful, and that went a long ways. Did you worry that you might have trouble doing that? No, I didn't worry. Only at that one point, because I think part of it was I was was by myself at that time because we had gotten separated. I didn't know what had happened to my friends or anyone it was I was I don't even remember anyone being with me but this lawyer whom I didn't know but there were a group of people who Mm -hmm. volunteered their time and their services to to help us and so we didn't spend like nights or something like that in jail you know like I said I never saw a cell so did you did you feel good when you went and sat in that place that you've been excluded from I never went oh you didn't but I worked there (laughs) (laughs) when I graduated from college and I taught uh, another friend of mine we were teachers you know we had student loans it was Christmas holidays and they were hiring people so we went down and we worked I remember I sold books I worked in a book department (laughs) and I don't ever remember going to the Richmond room yeah no never remember I mean been excluded you didn't want to be I didn't want to be a part never even crossed my mind you know it was like the store was desegregated that's what we wanted, you know, and that's what we had gotten. So as long as you had access, you didn't really care didn't whether really you went care. or not. <laughs> didn't really care. It didn't make any difference, you know, but yeah. the people who wanted to, yeah. which was important, who wanted to do that had the opportunity to do that, you know. Do you remember whether they integrated before the Civil Rights Act? I don't remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, so a lot of this, you know, after I graduated, uh, I taught at Maggie Walker, which was right down the street from uh, Virginia Union. I did my student teaching there mm-hmm. uh, in history. And then from doing my student te- teaching, I actually got hired. Okay. And so I came out of school and I taught. And I taught for, I think, three years. And I realized that I was so inexperienced from life, not mm-hmm. so much the teaching I could do, but the students were taller than I am. <laughs> they were more whirly than I was and everything like that, that I decided I needed to have more. Because remember, I mm-hmm. couldn't go out when I was a child. So I went to school, came home, or went to something, function a baseball or game with my brother. So I didn't have the experience, knew yeah. nothing, okay? And that's when I decided I would go. I needed. I wanted to get a master's. Mm-hmm. I wanted to become a guidance counselor to be able to help mm-hmm. students um, and to be better. Mm-hmm. And that's when I went to the University of Maryland to get my master's. And while there, I got a fellowship. So I ended up staying not one but two years. And I never went back to Richmond after yeah. that. Yeah. So when you called your father after you saw it on TV? Or? I don't think he had seen it yet. Yeah. But he, my father was, uh, was a gentleman, and he was, my dad was just, he was the best. Yeah. And, you know, he said, I remember, are you okay? Yeah. I said, yep, Dad, I'm okay. He says, as long as you're okay, that's fine. You need me, you call me. That must have felt good. That felt good, you know, yeah. but that's the way he was all the time, you know. Was your brother in Germany, I mean, in the service by then? He was in the service by then, so yeah. he was not there, yeah. So He wasn't there to keep you off of the streets? No, <laughs> off the streets, or either to get after me or say anything, but yeah. yeah. You know, I know this happened at some schools, but was there any um, protests or discussion at Virginia Union about the restrictions on students at that time, about no, signing out no. or anything like that? We accepted it. Yeah. It was a small black Baptist uh, school. Mm-hmm. So we had to go su- Sunday night, we had to go to BPU or whatever that is, uh, you know, some kind of church services at night. That was part of what we did, mm-hmm. you know, when um, we accepted that as a part of coming to school there mm-hmm. because those were the restrictions. And if you didn't do it, it would affect your grades and things like that. So to my knowledge, you know, we just never so you we, we, a we, bit we, we did our own out, way. But not any kind of open <laughs> yeah. confrontation. We we did it our own way. Yeah. We you know, there were ways of getting around stuff and, yeah. and I think we did, you yeah. know, without protesting everything, you know. So Yeah. One of the things I'm interested in and I've been studying a little bit is um, with the sit-in movement mm-hmm. is the, the, the participation of men and women, mm-hmm. you know. And, then, and I was wondering if you thought about 
that at all, or if there were any discussions about, you know, whether it was safe for women. No. Or, you know, I shouldn't don't do remember, this because, no. no don't, don't remember, remember that any of that. It was just, you know, it was a group of students who decided that this was something they wanted to do. Yeah. They didn't, we didn't think about gender. We didn't think about grade or age at that time. I think I had just, I was 18 when I went to school. I think I just turned 19 in December, and it ends in February. So we, we were, some of us were young, some of us, you know, just didn't really know the city. I don't even know if we almost, we didn't know the impact yeah. that we had or that we yeah. would have. So that came as a big surprise. You know, to me it was, hey, we, we wanted to uh, desegregate Richmond. We wanted to stop having to sit in the back of the bus. We wanted to be able to eat, to go where we wanted to go, do what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and, and that was all that was important. You know, we wanted Pat to be able to go get her hair cut anywhere she wanted to go, right. you know. And, and so that was all we were thinking. Yeah. You know, and the, 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 nothing else mattered. Yeah. And did you have a pretty good idea before you were arrested? That, did you know the lawyers were going to support you and be oh, yeah. there to get oh, yeah. you out? Oh, yeah. So you didn't oh, have yeah. to worry about like staying didn't worry in jail? About, didn't worry about All we had to do with our task was to go down, was to pick it, and to try to desegregate that room. That was our task. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all we focused on. And we yeah. had the support, you know, financially, uh, we, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you would know, so, so this happened in, you know, February of 1960. Yeah. And I know in April is when um, Miss Ella Baker called a meeting of student leaders from the sit-ins, and that mm -hmm. was at Raleigh University, and Charles Sherrod was one of the people mm -hmm. who went to that. Did you, were you aware of that at the time, or was no. that sort of just a kind of separate? That was just a separate... Yeah. Sort of thing, and then I think... So I, I would say that what happened at Virginia Union was just one incident. Yeah. Just was one incident. Focused on that. Was focused on that as I remember, but that's like fifty yeah. years ago. I know. Okay. Like. So to the best of my memory, that's all we did. We focused on that was our task, that was what yeah. we wanted to do. Those of us who participated at that point, some people probably went on and continued to do mm -hmm. sit ins at other places and everything like that, but my father refocused to me. <laughs> so after okay. that first one was like, okay. Okay, you, you did. But you, you had did you, it. you did it. You did. You wanted to do that. You did that now. You get yeah. back into the swing of things and, yeah. and get your education. Did you ever consider pursuing the law degree or did you decide you had a, other number interests? Of a number of times? A number of times. I, I remember. Um, I, I think I finally just realized that it would never be. I, I, I remember that at one point I thought about taking the LSAT. This is an adult, as an mm -hmm. adult, because once I got my once I got my master's, I actually went to work for um, a private company, and it was in Washington D.C., and it was an inner city plant, and my role was to try to get it was black people trying to get them off the welfare rolls off mm -hmm. drugs, and out of jail. <laughs> so I was a counselor, uh -huh. and I had whatever needed to be done, that's what I did. So for years, um, I, I worked there, I want to say, probably two years before moving to Minnesota. So was this like the late 60s or the 70s? Late 60s. Yeah. And did you enjoy that work? I did. Yeah. I did, I did. I mean, I think part of, um, I always had to, I wanted, always want to help, wanted to help people. I wanted um, to see people survive and to do better, mm -hmm. you know, so it was like, you know, getting someone out of jail, getting them on a path to learning a mm -hmm. trade was really a positive thing for me to do. Uh, there were people who were single moms who lived in housing and they couldn't get the uh, landlord to fix a stove or something mm -hmm. like that. Part of it was called an MA4 and MA5 contract. There were federal contracts that this company had. And the goal, as I said, was to get uh, people who were unemployable employed mm -hmm. and to keep them employed. So I worked there with that company for over 17 and a half years, but I moved mm -hmm. from uh, Washington to Minnesota, then back to Washington, and then to California, then to Minnesota. And 
that's where I was before I came to Massachusetts. Did you see any connections between that work and the civil rights movement? When you think about it, um, I think the sort of civil rights was about helping, mm -hmm. you know, helping people, um, helping people to um, get their rights, to be able to vote, to be able to spend their money where they wanted to be, get, helping people to become good citizens where they can become viable, take care of themselves, own homes. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. And that's how I've seen my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been a mentor. Uh, we were talking about my husband, uh, who's a trustee at his school. Uh, I didn't. We, were, we shared a lot, but I didn't share this. But I went with him a couple of times, and I would um, say to the lady at the reception, "Where's the nearest uh, store? You know, like a TJ Maxx." She says, "Oh, she says that's in Rochester." or Buffalo. I said, okay. And Rochester's like 60 miles. So I took the keys and I went to Mar went to Buff went to Rochester. <laughs> and I did it so like about three or four times. And then one time, Fred would have uh, things he had to do at night. They'd be in meetings like from 8 to 5. They'd come home 5.30. They'd need to change their clothes. A bus was going to pick us up and take us to a reception or a dinner right. I slid in at 6 o'clock one night. <laughs> <laughs> And Fred simply said to me, Jen, you're going to need to find something else to keep you busy. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I got the message. So I, I, I sometimes I present training mm -hmm. at the school. I've done resume counseling uh, with students, and I've also been a mentor. And this is at Alfred University? This is University? at Alfred University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually was appointed to the Leadership uh, Advisory Board. I was going to say, you've gotten a, 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 an award from them recently, I, right? I, I was named an honorary. University? I was named an honorary alumni. Okay. It was about two years ago, I think. Yeah. Two or three. Yeah. And did you, um, was part of that work with the Women's Center or something? At it, was the, right? it, it was with the Women's Center. That's okay. the, so what happened was the Women's um, Center, Leadership Center, and then there was another part that was a Leadership Center one of the sponsors of the Women's Leadership uh, Center died in a tragic mm -hmm. accident, and we renamed the center the Judson's Leadership Center, and they consolidated part of the le the women's program with the leadership program. And uh, I still am uh, active with that. In fact, we were talking, I have a meeting uh, in a couple of weeks uh, back there. And that's where I, you know, I've been mentored the students and October I'll be doing a training there as well. Can you tell me what you enjoy about that? Again, is that helping people and sharing. Yeah. I, I really, you know, I like being able to give back, you yeah. know, because I feel that so many people gave to me. When I was that young person in that city where the sailors and everybody, there were people who helped me to move on and to move out mm -hmm. and supported me um, to go on to go to to do what I've done so far mm -hmm. and so that's what I really enjoy giving yeah. back you know yeah you said earlier when we were talking I mean, maybe even on tape but that you haven't talked about being part of the city never and talked the civil about rights it. movement never never talked about it the first time that it came up was two years ago, I think it was, when they had the 50th anniversary and somebody started calling me saying, you have to come, you should come, and all about that. And I sort of said, yeah, okay, and all. And finally, I think Fred said, Jen, you should go. His, his job was so that he could not go at the time, but he said, you should go. And my niece lives in Richmond, and my oldest nephew they came to see me, and they were really impressed. Yeah. And when I went, I was I didn't realize the effect that we had had. We were given credit. I couldn't believe it. Credit for desegregating Richmond, Virginia, the city? I didn't know that. Yeah. Did not know that. And I go to campus, and here's a plaque, and there's my name. You know, I'm saying, oh, my God. This is just from what we did? That many years ago? Had no idea, Emily. 
So no it gave idea. You a different idea. Different, of... different perspective, but I still haven't shared it with a lot of people. And I don't know why. Maybe because I don't want to know if people know I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's the vainness well, of me. Let me let you, you know? in on a secret. A lot of people can't do math. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point, good point. So you can tell them. I can tell them, you know, know, because I haven't, uh, like at one point. And they'll just say I you were a child a, prodigy. I was a child prodigy. <laughs> and at one point I thought about inviting some people to this. And then I said, oh, I don't know. I'm going to try to get through it myself. And then I started thinking one time, well, what do I have to really say? You know, I mean, we did it we, yeah. because we wanted to. That's it. Well, I know you said that you were interested in history and yeah. you majored in it and you majored in it, taught it, taught it and yeah. continue to have an interest in it. And, yeah. And, and, you know, and then, well, I don't know, here you are, you're somebody who's had an impact yeah. that's very, I mean, yeah. everybody has some sort of impact on history, but mm -hmm. but yours is one that's a little bit more visible yeah. as yeah. part of the city. And, and my job doesn't know it. Nobody at my work knows this. So have, no do, you, do you think at all about sharing it or that it might be important? I don't know. You know, I go, you go back to that age thing. Oh, see somebody, oh, you were back then, you know. <laughs> back in the day, right? <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> so I don't know. And then um, I don't know why. It's, it's, just, it's just, you know, like washing your face, cleaning mm -hmm. your teeth. This is something that I did. I was very young. It was something very important to mm -hmm. me very meaningful for me. I have no regrets mm -hmm. in doing it, but I'm not a person who brags yeah. or talk about any accomplishments or anything. I'd rather talk about the accomplishment of my husband, yeah. whom I think has, you know, done a great job and is a very, very brilliant man that I enjoy, and my son. Those are the things that I, you know, yeah. share and, and have them have the limelight, you know. I guess a little bit of South still in me. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that, because of course I, you know, I teach yeah and um, and for my students one of the things that seems to be most meaningful them for them is to talk to people who did something when they were the same age yeah probably. and they yeah. say oh wow then it makes me think I can do something yeah, probably, you know yeah. and that I'm not you know there's all these things going on in the world yeah. and I think sometimes they feel overwhelmed and so if you ever talk to the students at Alfred, maybe share. I'd be I, interested to hear. I, I might. I, I think now, uh, and so there's so many other things that I'm involved in mm -hmm. that I, I am with students. Um, one of the women's organizations that I participate in out of Springfield, we have um, we have young girls that we work, excuse me, that we work with to try to. Uh, be she, you know, some of us are considered sheroes mm -hmm. to these young girls who maybe not have others that maybe sometimes I might share, and I might even share it with some of the members of my my organization because what it tells us is that you know you can have an impact, mm -hmm. you know, and it's important to share your skills mm -hmm. and your knowledge and everything that um, that you've learned mm -hmm. and acquired, you know. Can you talk about that? It always is. We're back. Can you tell me a little bit about that organization and the work? Um, so um, this organization is called The Links, L-I-N-K-S uh, Incorporated. Mm -hmm. It's a national women's organization made up predominantly of African-American women. It started in Philadelphia 100 years, not 100 years ago, many years ago because um, for social and friendship and now we uh, have spread all out. We're international as well as national. And we have uh, six facets that we operate under. You know, it's health and wellness, uh, the arts, um, national trends and services, international trends and services. Uh, I think I left one out. Um, youth, mm. services to youth. And so what our programs center around those facets, and this group that I'm in is out of Springfield. So what we've done is we've assessed the community of Springfield, which has a lot of needs. Mm -hmm. And um, we've started to try to mentor young girls. And some of them are parents that have no parenting skills, mm -hmm. don't know how to interface with the schools, uh, we've also started to support a house that uh, called the, it's called the Village. It's uh, women who have been incarcerated 
and in, on, and on drugs. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing, the organization is made up of people such as myself, I'm, uh, I'm an executive counselor, trained executive counselor, human resources, I know about job searching and those things, that we take our skills and we present workshops, counseling and tutoring and coaching these women to get successfully overcome their uh, addictions, become better parents, get jobs, get their own homes. And so uh, we meet uh, in Springfield in that surrounding area uh, monthly, okay. and we have projects that we work as well. How far is Springfield from here? Uh, about 50 miles, yeah. a little less than 50 miles. And so are, there, you, know, are you seeing progress? You we've see seen a lot of progress. We've, yeah. we've supported some of the young girls who have. Uh, so uh, let me back up. A number mm -hmm. of the people in there are, are, are lawyers. Mm. We have one, young, one lady who's a very good friend of mine who's a superior court judge. And we have a writer. We have different people. And we've actually stuck with some of these young ladies and uh, seeing them graduate from high school, go on to college, and we keep in touch with some of them. Uh, we also have a, um, an English, I believe she teaches English at UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. linguist, linguistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's actually sort of mentoring a young lady who graduated from high school and has gone on to UMass. So she's there with her and sort of, you know, continuing to work with her. So we've seen progress. We've done some things in the city. We haven't seen as much. It's just a lot of work that needs to be done mm -hmm. there. That must be rewarding. It is. It is. Is it hard to keep up with that and, and your work? Well, you know, I actually am involved in a lot of things. And I began to uh, scale back a little bit because so I live here in Northboro. And I actually was a library trustee for a couple of years. I was um, I chaired the community affairs committee, which did things in the community to enhance uh, the life of the mm. citizens and everything. Like uh, we did, um, we do town cleanup. We've done summer concerts in the park that's free and everything like that. So I chaired that for like 15 years, and I chaired the uh, the personnel board for the mm. town. Well. Two years ago, my husband decided that I should do something different. And I said, okay. And he says, uh, there's a vacancy for the Assabet Regional School. You should run. I said, I'm not running, Fred. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, you should run. It'd be something nice to do. I said, I'm not running. I got enough to do. So he says, well, nobody signed up. The date went by and everything like that. So he says, well, you should do a write-in. <laughs> yeah, Fred. So Fred told a few people. And I won through a write-in. So now I'm a school committee member uh, for a regional school, technical, vocational technical school. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder why. You so haven't thought I about did, starting a writing. <laughs> that I, I know. He does. He has a campaign. So I have to get signatures when he's running. So you yeah. have to have like 50 signatures. So, But he likes to do more than 50 because suppose somebody isn't a registered voter or something like that. So I help him to get signatures because he runs every year. Yeah. But so I did step down as a library trustee and I stepped down as the uh, chair of the Community Affairs Committee. So I still chair the personnel board and the Esbeth Valley and then I do my work with Alfred University and so I do a lot of mentoring. Yeah. I do a lot of minute I'm an HR manager um, and uh, I stay very busy with my job. I used to uh, in addition to being an HR manager, chair the Alternative Dispute Resolution, which is an or was a uh, process where if a person felt they were not being treated fairly or something like that, they could come and present their case, be evaluated, and either um, have a reversal or it would remain the same. So, was that within the company, or is that within the company? Yeah, mm -hmm. did that work well to avoid conflict or, or it does or it, it's, it? it's very similar to so if you're in a union mm -hmm. you have the five steps mm -hmm. uh, but as a not as a professional you don't so this is a way of working and it helps both the employee and the company but then it doesn't stop sometimes people continue on to do lawsuits mm -hmm. or um, MCAD discrimination suits and everything like that so oh my you know everything is sort of 
it's been along the same lines, mentoring, coaching, mm -hmm. helping, mm -hmm. you know, throughout my career. And you mentioned your husband and his elections and his uh -huh. work, so could you say just a little bit about that so there's some context for the oh. for, for other people? Well, Is when it? I met my husband, he was a selectman. And um, a selectman is in the state of, in, in Massachusetts is like um, a city council. And so he was a member of the city council. And instead of having a chair, a, a mayor, you would, one of the members would chair. So he's been a selectman. He's chaired the board of selectmen. But prior to then, he was actually chair of the personnel board. Mm. And then he became, like I said, a selectman and then he's been a town moderator for 10 years. The town moderator is, um, we have the old style government where you have town meetings and anybody who's a registered voter can come, be heard, listen to the budget, you know, questions and everything like that. And his job is to facilitate that meeting and to keep it orderly to get the budgets passed or whatever needs to happen. Um, and it resolve any conflicts mm -hmm. and all like that. And plus, he, his favorite thing, I think, is he, appo he appoints members to certain boards. And so he's my boss. He reminds, <laughs> he reminds me quite frequently he's my boss. So uh, as, a, as a personnel board member, he appoints me. But I was floored, Emily, when I had learned that he called the, um, the town administrator to see had, how had I done my job. <laughs> I cannot believe this. So how this, do you separate the work and coming home? <laughs> <laughs> very well, very well. You yeah. know, we, 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 uh, I think we both, uh, we both like and enjoy community work. Yeah. And um, like I was saying on the way coming over here, he was, he's being very supportive and coming with me today. But uh, the third weekend of September, he will be so busy because he's the voice of Applefest. And we have an Apple Fest uh, celebration every year about the third weekend in September. So we'll have a parade, we'll have fireworks, we'll have concerts and wow. everything. And he does all the announcing. So you keep busy. <laughs> so, so we both keep busy yeah. in town and we try to, you know, be supportive of each other. And, yeah. and I, I can speak for him. I don't know. I let him speak for me. But I think extremely supportive for me yeah yeah I couldn't do it you know without him because it's nice he's also a uh, human uh, resources okay. he has his own consulting practice and so he works with small and medium-sized companies doing consulting uh, human capital consulting and things like that and so we have the ability to share our work you know and sometimes mm -hmm. if I want to just bounce something off of him that I can because I know I'll get a fair assessment mm -hmm. and honest assessment. Yeah. Have you thought about running to be town moderator so that Heck you could no. be his boss? Heck <laughs> no. <laughs> Point him to a board. Listen, you have to know you have to know Robert Rules of Order. You have to be patient. <laughs> And you have to uh, speak very well. And he has a very, I mean, sometimes we go out sometimes and somebody said, oh, you should be uh, on radio. You, you should be an announcer. I just said. <laughs> but he's done that, been yeah, there, done yeah, that, you yeah. know. And sometimes I think he thinks he should do voiceover or something. But his, I don't have the patience, the knowledge, or the ability. I, get, I would probably, he stays what I admire. A lot of things about him, but he doesn't show any um, favoritism or any anything on his face. I probably would be saying, "You need to sit down and shut up." <laughs> <laughs> sort of like when the lawyer you're walking back out when after you were exactly, arrested. Exactly, exactly. Like, and, oh, and don't, you're ready don't to fight back. Me. Yeah. Right, right. You know, that's. I mean, uh, one of the things I'm also interested in. I was going to say one of the things I'm also interested in with the civil rights movement is is nonviolence and how it worked. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have an image of the civil rights movement as just being completely nonviolent and nobody ever had any urge for anything else no, or no. thought about anything no. else. That's but, not true. Yeah, that's not true. I mean, if you get spit at, spit on, it's hard not to be angry or not to show some emotions. 
Did did you encounter any of that when you were marching to downtown that day? Just the people were yelling at us, calling us names and everything, yeah. and you just sort of had to just keep focus on your goal and don't make eye contact. Yeah, that's how we had to do it. You know, yeah. if you look at them, you actually give in to them, mm -hmm. and you by acknowledging them. So you just keep where you're going. Don't look. Don't respond or anything. And did it help that you were doing that with your close friends? Well, we got separated. Oh, did you? Like, we were pretty, separated. Like right away? I don't, I don't even remember. I, I think I got arrested before them. Yeah. And, or, I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 So. so when you went back to, to Richmond for this reunion and Virginia Union and found out that, you know, people were saying you'd had this huge impact and stuff. I mean, what was it like to be back together with the, the students who had done that? It was wonderful. I had not seen Maurice and Pat in years. So the first thing, you know, we had an opportunity to, to catch up because Maurice had married a person uh, who was in the military, and they, she had traveled all over, and we'd lost contact with each other. And Pat still lives in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. Uh, I knew her husband, had met them when they were dating, so it was good to catch up. Um, overwhelming to see what really uh, people were saying. Yeah. They were calling us heroes. I said, oh, okay. You, this, this 34, a group of 34 desegregated the city of Richmond. Yeah. Didn't know we did that. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. To know, and I, and I guess I was very proud mm -hmm. that I had made the decision to participate, and this was the result. Yeah. Do you do you think about the the status of civil rights today? I do. Well, I do. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on that? <laughs> you know, I always have thoughts. The first thought that I have, and uh, this won't come as a surprise to Fred, I believe that racism is still rampant mm -hmm. and apparent in the United States today. I believe, I was, well, I will say, I was so shocked when Obama was elected president. I did not think that I would live to see an African-American president. Mm -hmm. Never in my wildest dreams. I thought that was something my son would experience. Mm -hmm. However, although he was elected, I think it's racism that has been a part of the issues that he has faced. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that people, what, uh, what just gets me so upset is that intelligent people don't see this and don't put a stop to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many senators and representatives that should never go back to Congress. You know, I mean, to sit and have lunch and say, hey, we're not going to agree or accept anything that he does. How could you do that? How could you not give this brilliant man an opportunity to be successful? Racism is still well. Mm -hmm. It's still alive. Mm -hmm. And um, there are other things, but that's the one that just... You know, and there's some, and I think sometimes, you know, what can I do? What should I do? And like I, I've said to Fred, sometimes I think I should just quit and go work for, you know, try to work for Obama, do something to try because it's not over. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that our children don't see color today. You know. Uh, and I, I have this conversation with my sister-in-law who lives in outside of uh, Washington in a place called Nooksville near Manassas and where they chose to live, just as where Fred and I have chosen to live, there are very few African Americans. So my son's friends are all white. Does that and, and his 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 cousins are the people of color that he knows closely and cares about and relates to. But when we talked about having four and five kids at our house, they were all mm -hmm, white. Mm -hmm. Does that create different kinds of challenges? I don't think so. I think for them, it's easier. Mm -hmm. You know, my son has never uh, known about having to sit in the back of the bus. My son doesn't, I think, well, I think he, in my opinion, and, and of course my husband may have a different opinion, when he was in the seventh grade, I think it was, he came home and announced he wanted his hair braided. I said, okay. 
So we began a routine, and every Sunday night, he'd read Saturday, Sunday, he'd take his hair out, and I'd braid it. I think he was about the only uh, African-American in his class, and that was his way of showing that he was different. And he wore his hair braided till he got to high school. Mm -hmm. And now he wears a phone. <laughs> 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 he, he, the only thing, the only time he could, in the summertime, he'll cut it because yeah. it's hot. Yeah. But my man lets his hair, he used to play in a band too. He lets his hair grow. It looks something like um, Richie. Um, was it um, the jazz? Uh, uh, I'm Lionel having, Richie. not Lionel Richie. Uh, uh, but he looks like a, 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 a Molly, Bob yeah. Molly, how Bob yeah. had the big hair. Yeah. My son has a big hair, yeah. you know, so he doesn't hide his ethnicity. Yeah. And then when he cuts it, you can't tell. Sometimes I have, friend, I have friends in California who say if he's coming out there, please have him shave <laughs> and everything because they may take a, him part of a Muslim or some mm, Islamic yeah. or shard or whatever. So. Does he see? Does he see the existence of racism still? I don't think so. No. 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 He. Never, never sees things in terms of color, which is good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if something happens to, in the, in in our day, if something happened to you, you didn't get promoted or you didn't do something, it was because of your race. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see that. He may see partiality. Yeah. But I don't. He doesn't see race. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you think of things that are important? Things that you think people should, you know, think about or know about. Things I haven't thought to ask you. Or things you said you haven't thought to ask me? Let me see. Oh, any of it. Uh, I'm thinking. I don't know. Um, that's a big question. It that's is. A, that's a loaded question. And I'm just trying to think about it. Um, I, I guess for me, just thinking about me, I think that I've always had the this, this civil rights fight in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, on my job, in my life, I will fight for what I think is right. If something is happening, a lot of times in my, in, in my work, people come to me mm -hmm. and they ask me for help. And I will give them that help. And it's off the record kind of thing, but it's more or less like, you know, they're dealing with, and a lot of times, and I see racism. I see it, you know, and I've been trying to figure out how do you get others to see the racism uh, that exists because it's so subtle. Mm -hmm. For an example, um, if you hire, you can hire a person of color mm -hmm. or female but you may not give them the total job or the job that they can be most successful in. Mm -hmm. and Or you can finally maybe hire a person of color who's very, very good, and you won't let them move. Mm -hmm. So you keep them right in that position because you don't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. But you lose them anyway because they'll go to another company. Right. So um, what I've been trying to, um, uh, I'll, I'll just give you some. Lately, um, our company seems to be changing the way they do business. So they don't have the old type HR. So they have business partners and so you're made, you end up with a lot of different projects, you know, salary planning, uh, HR review, things like that. But they don't look back at the basics. And I had, um, I, I just, I had a couple of experiences that someone came to me that someone was complaining that someone went in the ladies room and a person said I think you have the wrong bathroom and so nobody thought anything of it right and then um, I had somebody else to say you know there's someone visiting and we think that person is going through a, a change so I'm I'm working on transgender issues at my company and I'm this close to getting uh, gender neutral bathroom at least two general, general mm -hmm. neutral bathrooms near the manufacturing floor because I work for a manufacturing company there's like over 4,000 people lots of square footage but there's no gender neutral bathroom so that if I'm transitioning I have some place mm -hmm. I can comfortably go or if I'm just sick mm -hmm. and I want to go someplace like that so uh, I started that and then 
I had a situation where someone came to me and needed help mm -hmm. in my role. That's my role in trying to understand and trying to help that person that I'm actually helping to rewrite or put together training mm -hmm. to talk to management and leaders about sensitive issues like this. Mm -hmm. We've had it before, but in one situation, I mean, an employee says to someone, when did you know you were a lesbian? Or when did you know you were, uh, what did, when you were out with your back surgery, instead of, you know, you're out back surgery, did you, was that, did you transition? Mm -hmm. Stuff like the inappropriate conversations mm -hmm. and questions. So um, I'm working uh, with some people to try to train people to make things better mm -hmm. because it's, it's still, we got a long way to go. So do you find resistance to that, or is it just more like uh, just kind of uh, lethargy or, you know? I think people just don't know. Mm -hmm. Some people just don't know, and they just don't understand. But then there are some people who are going through things, and they don't know how to deal. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, recent situation I had is where a person um, it was born a female but feels that he he is a male, mm -hmm. but he's taken no steps, mm -hmm. okay? So people don't understand, and he, I think, hasn't really, you know, gotten his mind wrapped around that. And so people, he feel people discriminate or harass him. But harassing, saying, did you have a sex change, isn't really harassing. Mm -hmm. That's inappropriate. So training people not to ask personal and inappropriate mm -hmm. questions. So, I mean, so yeah, so, <laughs> it's, it's, so it goes from one thing, excuse me, to another, you know, yeah. but it's all related. Yeah. It's all related, you know, and it's about understanding differences, mm -hmm. valuing the differences, and letting people have their own um, ability to, to, to make their choices mm -hmm. and to live their choices. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think now, um, what's my next step? Yeah. You know, well, am I gonna gonna teach? Am I just gonna sit home and read like one of my girlfriends? Mm -hmm. Or you I know. don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see somebody shaking their head behind you. You know, um, but you know, I'm thinking about transitioning myself yeah. to figure out. You know, uh, maybe it's more community work. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, so you think you might want different challenges coming or can, in the yeah, future? Yeah, or whatever, you know. I, yeah. I'm really proud of myself if I get those two bathrooms at yeah. that company. I just am waiting, you know. It's budget. I got support. It's now getting the so budget to a, do that. So you've been able to convince people it's a oh, good thing. Yeah. It's just a question of yes. actually now implementing. Right, yeah. right. And then uh, next step is completing the training yeah. where I'll help to train managers. What do you do? How do you do? And you know, just coach. Yeah. So it sounds like some major accomplishment. For me. Yeah. 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 So can you think of any final thoughts? Or we can take a second and think about it, too. No. I think uh, I just about uh, shared just about everything that I can. Well, we really appreciate it. And no um, we're very pleased to have your story as well, part you. of the Civil Rights History Project. I hope it's helpful. It is. It is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.